So the social life of bacteria, that's the topic for the next 45 minutes. And specifically, I want to tell you about quorum sensing. This is another term that we coined back in the late 1990s, and it's a um, highly used term now among microbiologists. So we'll see what that is. Um, part of the inspiration for my research career comes from this guy, Ed Wilson. He's an ant biologist. And in the late 70s, he published a book called Sociobiology. And he was interested in social ants, and he realized that you could study sociality of any kind of organism as a biologist. This is very upsetting to anthropologists who claimed social activity of humans as their own. And Ed Wilson pointed out that you could study social activity of us the same way you study social activity of ants. Except for us, it's complicated because we can't help but put motives on our activities. We think we have free will. Um, so Ed Wilson uh, viewed sociology as a study of the genetic basis and environmental influences on social activities. And what a biologist means by social activities is the sum of conflict and cooperation between two or more individuals. So if you can measure conflict, recognize it, or study, measure cooperation, and see how often these things happen, you can get some sense of the social interactions of organisms. And the topic that I want to address today is about cheaters, individuals who benefit from social activities but don't contribute to social activities. So in humans, that's like uh, tax cheats. So we have some tax cheats in America. They don't pay their taxes. I understand there are a lot of tax cheats in Italy, so this is relevant. Uh, this quote is from my mother. She taught me that cheaters never prosper. And um, I, I took this as an article of faith. <laughs> but is it true? It is so it raises an issue that many of us have called Darwin's dilemma. Cheats should have a fitness advantage over cooperators because they don't pay into the system, but they benefit from the system. If you don't pay your taxes, you still get to drive on the roads that everybody else's taxes pay for. So what I want to know, among other things, is whether we really do have built-in deterrence to cheating, whether there's something in an individual that would discourage it to cheat. Are there some sort of evolved metabolic restraints on cheatings? Can cooperators police cheats do, well, you know, we can police um, tax cheats. We catch them sometimes. Do bacteria have a way of policing cheats, and can they penalize cheats? So these are some of the topics I'll touch on today, okay? So Vittorio told you that we coined this term about, oh, almost 10 years ago now. And we call it a new science. Um, around the, 19, the late 1990s, the tide started to change. People always thought that bacteria were the example that proved the rule, and the rule was the smaller the creature, the less value there was to social activities. And bacteria were just biological entities that were made to multiply and divide and multiply and divide. And this has given way now to this new science of sociomicrobiology, the study of genetic basis and environmental influences on social activity of bacteria. And my lab works on this for several reasons. First, once we recognize this, bacteria became nice models to understand the biology of sociality, just like they're nice models to study almost anything else. You can make mutants 
and have large social gatherings in a petri plate on your bench and see how the mutants interact. Hard to do with higher organisms. So I like bacteria. That's why I became a microbiologist. And if you really want to understand them, you can't ignore their social activities. And it's become evident that sociality is a target to develop new medicines to treat certain bacterial infections that are otherwise difficult to treat. So I want to tell you about uh, a type of cell-cell signaling that we work on and Vittorio works on, basal HSL signaling. This is a type of quorum sensing. So some of you in the room, many of you in the room already know a lot about this. And I'll specifically talk about quorum sensing and Pseudomonas aeruginosa, opportunistic pathogen that causes devastating human diseases. <clears throat> I'll give you a quick review of quorum sensing. What is it? How does it work? A little bit of an even quicker review of the evolution of cooperation. And then I want to tell you about social cheating and pseudomonas. And about whether pseudomonas cheats can cause a tragedy of the commons. Whether they can overrun a population of cooperators and actually break cooperation and cause the group to fail. And I'll tell you about how pseudomonas can restrain the emergence of social cheats. And the work I'm going to tell you about was done by these three investigators. Uh, Ajay Dandekar was a fellow in my lab. He's a lung, a lung doctor. He now has his own lab next to mine, and he um, uh, is a physician. He takes care of people with lung diseases in our hospital. Suda Chugani, who's a longtime senior research scientist in my lab, and Mei Jing Wang, who's uh, visiting from China. But first, some definitions, uh, just to sort of set the table so you know what I'm talking about. This is how I define cooperation. It's a behavior that provides a benefit to another individual, a recipient. A cheater, these are also called freeloaders, is an individual who doesn't cooperate, who cooperates less than their fair share, but who can gain benefit from others cooperating. Cheaters have a fitness advantage over cooperators because they don't pay the cost of cooperation, but they get the benefit. A green beard, I don't think I'll actually talk about green beards, but this is a hypothetical gene that causes in carriers both a phenotype that can be recognized, oop, a typo here, recognized by conspecifics. A, a, the, that gene is a green beard and a cooperative behavior towards others who show green beards. I'll talk about restraints, a self-imposed cost to cheating, and policing. This is also called punishment or sanctioning. These are terms from the population biology literature. Policing involves cooperators that hinder the success of social cheats, and it costs them to hinder the success of social cheats. So we pay a cost to police. And a tragedy of the commons was introduced by this econ economist in 1968 depletion of a common resource by acting rationally in one's self-interest. It's also called the commons dilemma, social dilemma, or a tragedy of the fishes. If there are fishermen and you have some quota put on them, there'll be cheats that take too many fish and they'll have an advantage, they'll be more successful, they'll be overfishing and then you'll have a collapse of the fish population. So first, a review of quorum sensing. This is a type of bacterial cell-cell communication. And it's used to control specific genes in bacteria. It allows coordination of group activities. So there's some sort of social action here. And the quorum sensing system that's been most well studied is 
this ACEL HSL type of quorum sensing that occurs in many, many species of proteobacteria. We now know of over 200 species that make these quorum sensing signals. The signals are dedicated. They're made by a family of ACEL HSL synthases, the LUXI family of enzymes. And there are co-evolved receptors, the LUXR family of receptors. And this co-evolution is important. True signaling systems communication involves co-evolution of the signal and the receptor. So this is a, an example of that. And they regulate different things in different bacterial species. I'll have more to say about this in a minute. This was first discovered in this marine bacterium called Vibrio fisheri. This is a petri plate with colonies of Vibrio fisheri. And the bacteria convert chemical energy into light energy. So the light emitted by the bacteria expose the film for this image. They make blue light. And they only make blue light when they reach a sufficient population density. So they do this on a petri plate where the colony is of high population density. So how, how do they know when they're at sufficient population density? So my lab and one other lab worked this out in the late 80s, really. And this cartoon I drew from a paper that reviewed all this by yet a third lab. So there's an operon required for light production, a cluster of co-transcribed genes called the Lux operon for Luxor, the god of, god of light. And um, this operon requires activation by a transcription factor called Luxor. So when Luxor bonds, binds to the promoter of this operon, it turns its transcription on, the bacteria make light. Luxar can only bind to the promoter when there's sufficient quorum sensing signal, shown as the triangles here. And the Luxi gene is responsible for signal production. So it makes this enzyme that catalyzes the synthesis of the triangles here that can diffuse in and out of cells. It passively moves in and out of cells. So at a low population density, it will always diffuse out down its concentration gradient. When there are sufficient numbers of cells around, the signal concentration will rise. And when it reaches nanomolar levels, it binds to Luxar, activates transcription of this operon. The bacteria make light. Luxi is positively auto-regulated by the system. It's the first gene in this operon. So the bacteria make low levels of signal that accumulate very slowly until they reach a critical density, and then they make even more signal. This is the signal. A colleague of mine, Anatol Eberhard, figured this out in uh, 1986, I think. So it's an amino acid not one of the 20 essentials. This is homoserine lactone attached to a fatty acid side chain. Uh, so in the late 80s, we were figuring out the basics of the system in Vibrio fisheri. We figured out the signal, figured out there was a transcriptional activator that responded to the signal and so forth. In the early 90s, we started to identify signals made by other bacteria. So there are, we discovered Luxi type synthases in other proteobacteria, gram-negative bacteria, and they all make homoserine lactone that are attached to some sort of acid. So many of the ones that we've discovered so far are attached to varying side chain link fatty acids. More recently, we've discovered a couple that are aryl HSLs. There are aromatic compounds attached to a homoserine lactone. And the cognate R proteins are most sensitive to the specific eye signals that are generated. 
So what are the typical types of things that are controlled by quorum sensing? Well, quorum sensing, so then in the um, sort of the decade of 2000 to 2010, we did a lot of transcriptomics, figuring out what sort of things were controlled by quorum sensing. And basically there are a lot of things, different things in different bacteria. In Pseudomonas, there are about 300 genes, I'll say more about this in a minute, controlled by quorum sensing. And aside from the fact that many of the genes are responsible for the production of extracellular things, that's a big mess and we couldn't make too much out of it at, at the time. Other than we realized that quorum sensing controls among other things what population biologists call public goods shared resources. Light, I believe, is an example of a public good. Uh, no individual Vibrio fisheri makes enough light for biological detection. It's expensive to make light, but nothing can see it unless Vibrio is growing as a group and then we can see the collective activity of the group. So they make the, the, the only benefit of making light is if they're together. Exoenzymes are commonly controlled by quorum sensing, things like proteases. I'll talk a lot about extracellular proteases of Pseudomonas today. So they secrete the proteases, and if there is a protein in their environment, the proteases will break it down into digestible pieces that individual cells can transport in and use as carbon and energy sources. So exoenzymes have to, there have to be enough of these enzymes to raise the concentration of the amino acid products to a level where transport can bring them in. So these are public goods. Toxic compounds like antibiotics are often regulated by quorum sensing. Again, an individual bacterium can't make enough of an antibiotic to threaten a competitor. But a, a dense group of bacteria can make enough antibiotic to protect itself from competing species. So quick review of Pseudomonas, opportunistic pathogen that senses cell density by acyl-HSL quorum sensing. And the idea is that when it's at low bacterial density, the quorum sensing signals will be at low concentrations. And there'll be little activation of whatever genes are controlled by quorum sensing. And we know genes involved in virulence are controlled by quorum sensing and genes involved in normal biofilm development are controlled by quorum sensing. So Pseudomonas will grow and at a sufficiently high population density, the signals will cause the coordinate activation of over 300 genes. And what I mentioned before, I'll remind you, is the genes coding for secreted products or the production of secreted products are overrepresented in the quorum sensing regulon. But there are other things regulated by quorum sensing. There are two quorum sensing sy systems in Pseudomonas, so it's a little more complicated than Vibrio. And there is a short chain signal made that I'll call the C4HSL, a long chain signal, the C12HSL. And here they are. This is the C4. It's made by a Luxi homolog called RELI, and there's a Luxar homolog that's a transcriptional activator called RELR. And here's the long chain signal, the C12 signal, LAS I and LAS R. And if I do get to the last slide, important for the discussion, is that LAS R and I regulate REL R and I. So LAS R and I control a lot of genes, including REL R. So we say that LAS R and I are on top of a quorum sensing cascade. You don't get the REL system to kick in till after the LAS system is kicked in. And that's sort of cartooned here. So here's LAS R and I. LAS I makes the C12 signal. 
binds to Lyos R, activates a whole set of genes, including Rel R, Rel R and Rel I. C4 binds to Rel R and activates an overlapping set of genes with the Lyos R regulon. There's um, a third Luxar homolog on Pseudomonas that we call QSCR. And we call this an, an orphan because it doesn't have a cognate co-evolved digene, but it responds to the C12 signal. And uh, Vittorio and I argue about what to call this. So you guys probably all call it a solo. And um, he's trying to convince me to change, but I haven't yet. And it regulates an overlapping set of genes. Uh, most of the genes, particularly the ones controlled also by LASR and RELR, are repressed by QSCR. So LASR has become a therapeutic target because quorum sensing activates virulence genes. But it turns out that LASR mutants are common in certain infections that we'd like to be able to treat. Infections of people with the genetic disease cystic fibrosis, they become colon their lungs become colonized with pseudomonas, and over time, LASR mutants accumulate. Uh, people on ventilators in the hospital, uh, LASR mutants accumulate on those ventilator devices. And we'd like to know why LASR mutants are common in these infections and whether that means trying to develop therapeutics that target quorum sensing is a stupid idea or not. Well, they could be social cheats, right? They could be benefiting from others in the group that are making all of the products. So it could be a, a free rider problem. <coughs> These LASR mutants might not share in the production costs of public goods like secreted proteases and antibiotics, but they could accrue the benefit of an individual member of the group. It would seem that cheaters should cause a tragedy of the commons if this is the case, and that pseudomonas infections should be self-resolving, but they're not. So what about quorum sensing and control of public goods? Well, we know that exoenzyme synthesis is controlled by LASR. We know that RELR, which is activated by LASR, controls synthesis of toxic molecules like cyanide. Pseudomonas makes cyanide. Um, but there are exceptions that I've mentioned already. The one that I'll talk about today is adenosine catabolism. So quorum sensing activates an enzyme required for pseudomonas to be able to grow on adenosine also for pseudomonas to be able to grow on certain peptides. Um, and it activates a cytochrome oxidase. We don't know why, but maybe it's to compensate for cyanide production. So the enzymes in pseudomonas that are most sensitive to cyanide are cytochrome. Well, we're interested in adenosine. This is a cell-associated enzyme. And we want, wondered why would cells want to regulate a cell-associated enzyme, I'll call it a private good, by quorum sensing. It can't be to coordinate group activities. <coughs> so we focused on this gene, NUH, which codes for this nucleoside hydrolase that is required to grow on adenosine. Uh, we did that because this group in Switzerland had reported that LASR mutants don't grow on adenosine as sole source of carbon. And our hypothesis was that relatively few cellular processes that we call private goods, they're not shared amongst the group, are in the quorum sensing regulon to allow a metabolic selection against quorum sensing mutants as social cheats. And we built on experiments that were done by uh, Martin Schuster, who was a postdoc in my lab, and uh, 
did some really neat experiments when he set up his own lab in Oregon, and Steve Diggle, who's in Nottingham. In Schuster's lab, they developed a system where Lassar mutants predictably emerge as social cheats and populations of cooperators. And they do this by growing Pseudomonas on casein as the sole source of carbon and energy. So it has to use Lassar activated proteases to grow on casein. And after prolonged growth, Lassar mutants arise and they become a stable subpopulation, about 25 to 50% of the, the total. But there's no tragedy of the commons. They level off at 25 to 50%, which is interesting in itself. And the experimental setup is simple. You grow Pseudomonas on a minimal medium with casein as the only carbon and energy source. This is our favorite strain, PaO1. And on this minimal medium, it will grow in the log phase of growth. It will double every few hours over a 24-hour period. So you can come once a day and subculture it, dilute it, back dilute it, and it'll grow up again and do this every day. And then we screen for cheaters at five-day intervals. Here's how we screen for cheaters. So proteases, extracellular protease is controlled by quorum sensing. So we screen for individuals that don't make protease. So here's one that's making protease. This is skim milk auger. Has other nutrients in it, so everything grows. But only the ones making protease clear a zone around the colony. This one's making protease and this isn't. And then we also screen for growth on adenosine. So here's a auger with adenosine as the only carbon and energy source. So this guy, guy is growing on adenosine that's making protease. This guy doesn't grow on adenosine and doesn't make protease. So it has these two defects and it turns out that the way to get to these two defects in a single strain always in these experiments is a Lassar mutant. It's a regulatory mutant that controls both of these. So you can, you can sequence the mutants and all of the mutants have defects in Lassar and this just shows where they are. There's no defects in the protease gene or the, or the nucleosidase gene. And so the mutants start to emerge at levels at which they can see them after about two weeks of transfers in this medium. And just like Schuster, they reach about 50% and then they level off. So I wanna talk about restraint for a minute whether Pseudomonas has a visceral way of controlling whether these um, cheats emerge. And we wondered what happens if you include in the medium not only casein but also adenosine. So there's a public good required for casein metabolism and a private good required for adenosine metabolism both are controlled by Lassar. Casein is the good energy source for Pseudomonas, and they sort of limp along on adenosine. And our hypothesis was that if there's adenosine in the medium, there'll be some penalty to cheating. It will reduce the frequency of social cheats. It'll be a metabolic constraint, because the cheaters, well, they can use the product of the uh, protease, but they can't use adenosine. So here's an uh, example of an experiment done by Ajay Dandekar. He, uh, there were four, he called them doses, he's a doctor, I told you. Four doses of casein and adenosine. Um, the, the experiment I showed was on 1% adenosine. He decreased the adenosine and uh, decreased the casein and increase the adenosine in these experiments. 
always the total was 1% carbon. And so here's what happened. Here's the control. I already showed you this experiment. Cheaters emerge on pure casein. But any time we added adenosine at over 0.5%, cheaters were restrained. They didn't emerge. So here's 0.75% adenosine and 0.25% casein. No cheaters emerging. So adenosine is a private good, but does a private good have to be controlled by quorum sensing? And the answer is yes. We replace the adenosine with glucose, which is metabolized by a private good, but it's quorum sensing independent. And glucose doesn't suppress the emergence of last R mutant sheets. This experiment, we started with a low concentration of casein, as low as the lowest in the last experiment. Cheaters emerge, and if you add glucose, maybe they emerge a little more slowly, but they still emerge and they reach about the same level. So it's co-regulation of a private good and a public good by LASR that restrains the emergence of cheats. So this is a, a constraint mechanism, this co-evolution, this co-regulation of public and private goods puts a penalty on cheats. Well, what about a tragedy of the commons? It would be nice if we could induce one. Uh, you know, maybe there'd be some future to that as a technology. And in our evolution experiments, there was this stable equilibrium, and we wanted to know why cheaters should cause a tragedy of the commons. And we had our glib explanation is that the cost of cooperation is not so high, uh, and so it's the tax cheat analogy. As long as there's not too many tax cheats, things work, and we don't put a lot of energy into catching them, uh, particularly if they're paying some of their taxes. Well, we wondered if we could increase the cost of cooperation. And, and maybe that would induce a tragedy of the commons. And the way we set out to do this was by removing ammonium chloride from the medium. Now casein has to serve as the sole source of nitrogen as well as carbon and energy. And there's an, a need for the system to have more protease. And the question is, will that cause a tragedy of the commons? And if it does, is this incentive, incentive to cooperate by adenosine present still functional? And so the next slide should show the results here. So here we've used casein as a sole source of energy, carbon, and nitrogen. And this shows how much of this pigment, pyocyanin, which is regulated by quorum sensing, is made during one of our social evolution experiments. So here we have ammonium chloride in the medium. This is like the experiments I did before. And the system tends towards optimization, so there's more pyocyanin made over time. It rises about fourfold during the time of this experiment. If we leave out ammonium chloride, pyocyanin increases dramatically. So the cells have to ramp up quorum sensing. We also showed that the cells make more protease. They ramp up quorum sensing to make more protease, we presume. And this just shows how much more pyocyanin a 30-day-old culture grown without ammonium makes than how much it makes with ammonium. And it turns out that a tragedy occurs in the absence of ammonium chloride. There's three separate experiments. After about 15 days, cheats start to emerge, and they rise very rapidly. So with ammonium chloride, they level off about here without 
they rise to about 80%. And then there are no longer enough cooperators so that we can transfer and get regrowth. So there's a sort of a tragedy that occurs. And here is the same experiment with adenosine in the medium. So this constraining mechanism still works, even though there's a really strong fitness benefit to cheating. What about pleasing? So pleasing is the ability of the cooperators to make something to control cheats. And a lot of bacterial population biologists have been interested in pleasing. And there's only one example in the literature of a, a pleasing effect. And it's in a bac special bacterium called Myxococcus. Uh, there's no mechanism for pleasing that's ever been described. So we were wondering about pleasing. And maybe pleasing is causing this stable equilibrium of cooperators and cheats. So we, we don't know why there's this stable uh, equilibrium. One possibility is the cheats aren't really pure. So in sociality, any behavior is always conditional. So proteases you, is a public good when cells are growing on protein. If cells make protease in a medium where they're growing on amino acids anyway, it's not a public good. It's actually a sort of useless good. But maybe cheats aren't pure. Maybe they evolved to provide some benefit to cooperators. That's one possibility for this equilibrium. The other that I favored is that maybe the cooperators are pleasing the cheats. So I, Ajay Dandekar and I argued about these ideas. And he said, well, how are they policing the cheats? And I said, I had to think really fast. I said, well, maybe, remember, RELR activates genes for toxics, like hydrogen cyanide. And if it co-activates genes for resistance to those toxics, like a cytochrome oxidase, then the cooperators could hurt the cheats. The cooperators uh, will activate their rail system. The cheats um, can't because they don't have LASR, so they can't activate uh, transcription of RELR. So the test of that was to start with a RELR mutant. Just start our social evolution experiments with a RELR mutant. It won't make hydrogen cyanide or any of these other toxics. And my prediction was that even in the presence of ammonium chloride, the system should collapse. Pleasing will be lost. So Mei Zhang did these experiments. And she's actually done nine repeats of experiments starting with RELR mutant. Here's a control if you start with the wild type and her hands. Uh, doing this in duplicate, uh, somewhere between 20 and 40 percent of the individuals were cheats. With RELR mutants, I think it was seven out of nine times the system crashed. Here's an example where cheats started emerging after uh, six days, I think. They quickly went up to 80 percent of the population, and then uh, on, that started to impact the total numbers of bacteria and uh, cooperation was broken and that was the end of the experiment. Sometimes it took much longer for the cheats to emerge. So there's some time variability here, but quite often they emerge, they rise rapidly and there's a crash. Let's see if I can remember how to describe these experiments. These are new experiments. So the hypothesis is that RELR was inducing hydrogen cyanide production 
and immunity to hydrogen cyanide. So we did a bunch of experiments with laboratory-derived strains. If the competitor was wild type and the co cooperator was wild type, the numbers of competitor reached about 10 to the 10th after a day of growth in these experiments. If we started with a wild type cooperator and a competitor that was rel R negative, so it can't make hydrogen cyanide or presumably resistance to hydrogen cyanide, then the yield was greatly reduced after a day. Here's a hydrogen cyanide negative and a hydrogen cyanide negative. There's no ability to police. And here's a rel R negative as a competitor against a hydrogen cyanide negative, and there's no policing. So May's done a bunch of other experiments, but I won't go through everything. It looks to us like rel R induction of hydrogen cyanide is retarding the growth of cheats and that that is policing the cheats and, and limiting their ability to take over the population. So what have we learned? Well, all of our experiments are laboratory experiments, right? So I don't know what happens out in the real world, but in our idealized homogeneous lab cultures, LASR mutant social cheats emerge among cooperators. Quorum sensing co-regulation of a private good with public goods affords a strong constraint on cheats. If cooperation is made to be expensive, the incentive to cheat increases, and this can cause a tragedy. And this, you know, why control, why have this LAS R to REL R cascade of regulation? Well, there are probably a lot of reasons, but it looks like one of them is it affords pseudomonas cooperators an ability to police cheats. So we now have another example of policing in the microbial world, and we have a mechanism, a policing mechanism. Cooperators produce cyanide and show enhanced res resistance to cyanide. <coughs> Why do LASR mutants emerge in some types of persistent infections? Well, the answer is we don't know. You know, our laboratory experiments tell us about the laboratory. It could be social cheating. There's a lab directly downstairs from us that doesn't think so. They think after the infection is established, LASR mutants have a general growth advantage, specifically in the infection. And there's this idea of immune evasion. So after the infection is established, pseudomonas can hide out, uh, not make these factors that we can respond to. Our big idea, our 20-year plan after, in 20 years I'll be 85 and in my rocking chair, watching someone, I hope, who's learned about communication and control of cooperation and has devised ways to induce a tragedy of the commons and an infection, a new way to treat diseases other than antibiotics. That, that's the dream. Uh, and just to finish, uh, the group, I told you about the people working on social interactions and pseudomonas. We're still working on details of the regulatory mechanism. And this is a postdoc, Maureen Thomason, who's working on small regulatory RNAs and pseudomonas. We have a group working on Burkholderia and uh, a very small group at the moment working on quorum sensing and plant microbe interactions and a graduate student who's developing uh, synthetic models of quorum sensing control of cooperation. And uh, the, uh, these guys tell me I have to put this on the last slide, so I did. Uh, and I'll be happy to take any questions you have.